And so just from the concept of gold revaluation itself, that a central bank would be motivated to simply say that gold is now at a different exchange rate with its liability, the dollar or the euro, or whatever the currency might be, that itself proves that gold really is the money here, whereas the money substitute, the currency is actually the substitute for the gold. How can you possibly increase liquidity in the treasury market when there is no liquidity? Well, one thing you could do is allow rates to rise to the free market level where people would actually buy treasuries for their yield, but that would be like, you know, 20, 25% or some crazy amount like that. That's not happening. What else could you do? Well, maybe you could like douse them with a hose. Don't make me get the hose. Open wide. Or you could rub lotion on it. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. Speaking of liquidity, this week's video is brought to you by Molten Boron. Nobody doesn't like Molten Boron. Hey guys, Rafi here from the Endgame Investor, and today we're going to talk about gold revaluation. What is gold revaluation, and what does it have to do with treasury liquidity, which has been deteriorating since the Fed started hiking interest rates and is now at the lowest level since March 2020, which was only rivaled by the previous lowest levels of the financial crisis of 2008. Well, gold revaluation is simple, if not just plain stupid. Not in the sense that it doesn't make sense to do, but it's just like saying abracadabra. It's a magic financial spell. We've seen gold revaluation before. It was in 1933 when the federal government revalued gold from $21 an ounce to $35 an ounce. This, of course, was after it succeeded in pilfering the entire gold supply of United States citizens, which makes sense because if the federal government under Roosevelt just suddenly said that gold is now $35 an ounce from $21 an ounce, then the people's purchasing power who owned gold wouldn't have been affected and you wouldn't have had a wealth transfer to the federal government from the people. The objective was to steal from them. So first he took all the gold for $21 an ounce forced them to give it to him on $21 an ounce, and then said after he owned the gold that it's now $35 an ounce. This is simple gold revaluation and allowed the Fed to print more money substitutes and inflate its way out of the Great Depression. Or in other words, get out of the Great Depression while still getting richer for itself by stealing from the people instead. And so just from the concept of gold revaluation itself, that a central bank would be motivated to simply say that gold is now at a different exchange rate with its liability, the dollar or the euro, or whatever the currency might be, that itself proves that gold really is the money here, whereas the money substitute, the currency is actually the substitute for the gold. Now, what would gold revaluation be now? Exhibit one, we have here the Fed's balance sheet for November 16th, 2022. Here we have assets. This is literally what backs the dollar because the dollar, what is it? It is a unit of liability of the central bank. This is what stands behind those liabilities, those dollars. Assets, the first row we have here, gold certificate account. Okay, and it says $11,037,000. Well, either they own phenomenally little gold or the number is a little bit off. The truth is that gold is valued on the Fed's balance sheet and on all central bank balance sheet at the last statutory exchange rate with the dollar, which was $42.22 an ounce in 1973. That was the last attempt to restore the link between the direct link, at least between gold and the dollar, and it failed. But the number, the value, the statutory value for gold on central bank balance sheet has never changed since then. Now, a gold revaluation would literally be the Federal Reserve marking gold to market, to its market value of around 1800, 1750, whatever dollars an ounce it is today. And that would make the Fed's balance sheet look a lot more balanced because the amount of gold in its balance sheet would go from about $11,037,000 to about $470 billion at around $1,800 an ounce. So that would be marking gold directly to market. And that would make the Fed appear a lot more solvent, but it doesn't really change reality because gold is valued at whatever the market value is. 
meaning it turns the exchange rate between dollars and gold. The market value is now 1800 or 1750, depends on when you're watching this, who knows? But marking the gold to, to market, revaluing in that sense, would not really accomplish anything because gold already is valued at that exchange rate on the bullion market. However, what would make the Fed, what would change its balance sheet, shore it up for, uh, in a real sense, that would be marking gold to an exchange rate with the dollar at a price that would balance its liabilities at 100%, which would be about $40,000 or so an ounce. That would mean that every single liability, every single dollar is backed buy gold 100%, you could take 40,000 of those dollars and redeem it for an ounce of gold from the central bank, from the Federal Reserve, that would balance its balance sheet by 100%. And what would happen to the purchasing power of the dollar in that scenario? It would plummet. Everyone with dollars, their purchasing power would fall about, let's say, 2,000 to 40,000 It would buy about 20 times. Everybody, everybody's dollars would fall about 20 times in purchasing power and people with gold, their purchasing power would be transferred to the people with gold. So their purchasing power would increase by about 20 times. Now, what does this have to do with treasury liquidity? Well, let's move to the FT for a second. This is from the Financial Times. What's the date? November 15th, just last week, the cracks in the US treasury bond market. The big read, it says. The meltdown in UK guilds exposed the vulnerability of large bond markets could the biggest of them survive a wave of selling? Buying and selling in the world's biggest bond market is supposed to be easy. However, for most of the year, most of this year, says Gregory Whiteley, a bond portfolio manager at Double Line Capital, is it has been anything but straightforward. Whiteley says a trader used to be able to get hold of 400 million of US Treasury bonds, not an outsized quantity in this forward $24 trillion market, as a routine matter. But now that typically involves breaking up the order into smaller chunks. <laughs> Perhaps doing 100 million in the trade electronically, explains, and then picking up the phone to see if they can prize the rest of the debt of the hands of Wall Street's trading desk for over the course of the day. It's a big problem. Now, here is the graph that the FT shows in terms of the depth, the liquidity of the treasury market, market depth, million, one month moving average on the left here. We are down to what looks to be about 100 million, maybe a little bit more than 100 million dollars. That's how much you can buy or sell without changing the price. Meaning at any given point in time, the amount of demand for treasuries at this price that whatever it is at that instant in time is about $100 million. Now this is, uh, looks like, this looks very close to the all-time low, which I believe was hit in March 2020 when the world was shutting down for the best reasons for our, our wise scientists who, uh, whatever. And the last time we had liquidity that low in the treasury market was 2008, the end of 2008, during the depths of the financial crisis. And then what raised liquidity back up? It was the Fed going in and buying a whole bunch of bonds that increased the liquidity in obvious ways. Water, water, water. Water, water. Because when the Fed buys a bunch of bonds, that increases demand, and therefore more people can sell bonds, and that increases market depth. It says here, but the sense of vulnerability around the U.S. Treasury market is a matter of vital concern for investors, given that everyone from pension funds to foreign governments puts their money in the market for safekeeping, making it the world's de facto borrowing benchmark. Now, that is true. The Treasury market is the world's de facto borrowing benchmark. Why is that the case? Because it is the most liquid financial asset in the world, or at least it was. Now, what is the definition of money according to Austrian school economists? According to the founder of the Austrian school of economics, Karl Menger, money is by definition the most liquid commodity. That means the commodity that you can exchange easiest for any other good or service on the planet. That's what makes it liquid because the demand for it is the highest and demand to sell it is also the highest. It means the, the market depth for money itself is the most of any other commodity, and that's what makes it the best money. Now, there is no transition from non-moneyness to moneyness. There's no hard line between non-moneys and money. It's a continuum. We happen to call the most liquid commodity money, giving it the first place or the, being the best money, but other commodities serve as monies, maybe with slightly less liquidity. They're not as good monies. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the liquidity levels in the treasury market, it's not just some academic point. The fulcrum of the entire dollar system itself is treasury liquidity because the fact that it is the most liquid market in the world means that 
most monies or most currencies are parked in that market, which makes the market huge because they put it there while they're trying to figure out what else to do with it. So in order to mimic money, treasuries have to be the most liquid market in the world. This is just mimicking the property of money. The dollar in the treasury market is still a money substitute, but by mimicking the attributes that make money, money being the most liquid commodity in the world, the treasury market and its unit, the dollar, can function as a good money substitute and is still functioning today. People still use the stupid thing. But once liquidity dries up in the treasury market and you have big swings in yields to the point where nobody knows what the value of a treasury is or what the purchasing power of a treasury is and you can't redeem it for a predictable amount of dollars, then the dollar no longer works as a functioning money substitute. And you have to move to something else that will take its place as the most liquid commodity, which is, of course, gold. And now that's why money will panic out of U.S. treasuries because nobody will know what they're worth and they will automatically have to go to the most liquid commodity in the world itself, which is gold, the metal, the physical thing. Tying this back into gold revaluation once the Fed goes back into the bond markets and goes back to QE, the purchasing power of the dollar is going to fall hard and fast. And there's going to be a flood of capital into gold. And the market is going to revalue gold if the Fed won't do it itself. And that's when the, the Fed will quote unquote, mobilize its gold. But really it doesn't have gold. It is called a gold certificate account as I showed you earlier in this video. It is not a gold account. They do not own the gold in Fort Knox. The treasury owns the gold in Fort Knox and the Fed owns certificates to that gold. They own a right to it. The point of revaluing gold, whether the market does it or whether the Fed does it because the market forces it to do it, that is when the economy is trying to make gold the most liquid commodity Again, itself, instead of the money substitute, because you need a most liquid commodity in order to have a functioning money in the world. And now in order for gold to be the most liquid commodity, there would have to be an exchange rate with currencies that would at the same time encourage most people to sell their gold in exchange for goods and services and the most people possible to exchange their goods and services for gold. Once you have that maximum number, that is the exchange rate where gold is the most liquid and then gold becomes the most liquid commodity once again, this time directly. I'm not saying it's not money now. I'm saying that money substitutes have taken all the liquidity. But once the liquidity is drained from the treasury market, the chief gold money substitute market, then that liquidity has to change to somewhere and it's going to have to change to the gold market itself. And in the initial stages following the cracking of the treasury market, the exchange rate between gold and central bank liabilities, also known as currencies, is going to have to be the maximum in order to reach a maximum liquidity point so the world can have a functioning money. And no, it's not going to be cryptocurrencies. The cryptocurrencies are on top of the pyramid. They are not their own pyramid. They never were, and they never will be. And so what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, is that money is by definition the most liquid commodity. Right now, that market is still the treasury market, but it's not going to last much longer. And either the Fed is going to come into the market to increase that liquidity again and destroy the purchasing power of the dollar, meaning inflate again, and the market itself is going to revalue gold, or the Fed is going to give up and revalue gold statutorily to whatever the number is that makes gold the most liquid commodity again. So all we have to do now is wait for the treasury market to crack. Because after the treasury market cracks, we're going to see the crack up boom. It's not going to be gradual. It's not going to take years. It's not going to take months. It is going to be very quick once it starts, just like Sam Bankman Freed's pyramid collapsed in a matter of days, the dollar pyramid will also collapse in a matter of days or weeks. It's not going to take longer than that. And once it starts, everyone is going to know. Has it started yet? No, but we're close now and we're going to get there pretty soon. This is Rafi of the Endgame Investor. If you haven't joined my Patreon yet, 
I got something really cool coming down the pipe. It's why there will be no successful central bank digital currencies. The elitists, the globalists will not take over the world, and I will prove it from biblical sources. All you need to upset these people's plans is one person who doesn't believe in them, and we've got more than one this time. Just like all you needed to collapse Bankman Fried's empire of nothingness was a single tweet from Binance that said they weren't investing in it, and the whole thing went to hell. Or you can also become an Endgame investor by signing up for a two-week free trial of the Endgame Investor, link in the description below, where I went a little bit more deeply into this monetary philosophy that makes gold the money and dollar the money substitute, and crypto the substitute of the substitute and cannot be the base of its own pyramid. And where does silver come into this? Well, there's gold and there's gold substitutes. What's more liquid, gold or silver? Well, when you have a functioning gold substitute, liquidity in silver is very low because gold substitutes, paper, digital, whatever, that can split gold into whatever amount, can function a lot better than actual metal you have to hold in your pocket. But when gold substitutes are no longer trusted, the only viable gold substitute is silver itself, which means liquidity in silver becomes a maximum and silver becomes money once again. There will be a time in the initial stages of the end game that there will be no functioning gold substitute and the only functioning gold substitute will be physical silver, which means silver will be the main money and gold will be the silver substitute instead of silver being the gold substitute. That will not last long because we will not be trading silver coins for that long in the initial stages, but that is when you want to take your silver and buy whatever you can with it.